face are uh, are uh, are facing us, and so hopefully you'll find the the style of the course interesting. We have uh, uh, both uh, case studies that'll help you really understand the detailed uh, you know ways in which people present with some of these complex illnesses, and that you know we're not trying to be medical school here. We're trying to uh, help you as engineers uh, be able to think about and understand the, the complexities of, of uh, disease and biology, but it's nice to see how these these real people will actually uh, be suffering from disorders, how they'll present, what the challenges and complications that you have for diagnosis and treatment actually are. So at the end of today's lecture, we'll actually do a, a case study that relates to the, the central nervous system, which is the, the topic for today. Um, so I'm just one bit about myself. I, uh, I have a lab over in the Clark Center. We do research into actually uh, nervous system um, questions. Uh, I'm also a psychiatrist, and I see patients over in the uh, uh, Quarry Road uh, Psychiatry Clinic here at Stanford, and I focus on depression and uh, also autism spectrum disease. So if any of you have, you know, career questions, you know, the balance between engineering and, and medicine and different uh, choices, feel free to, to, to ping me, and uh, I can help you uh, sort through some of those uh, complex issues. So, uh, and then any announcements before the class from the TAs on anything? Um, any questions from anybody about the, the class as a whole, or um, you can also ask the TAs or myself by email or office? Okay, so let's talk about the central nervous system. This um, is one of the most mysterious uh, parts of the uh, human body. It's also um, one of the most interesting. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and so we'll talk about the anatomy, some of the complexity of it, and then we'll get right into some illustrative disorders that help us understand the, the engineering challenges that are faced, and that'll bring us to instrumentation and uh, uh, therapies. By the way, always feel free to pipe in with, with questions as we go. And I'll have questions for you, actually, along the way. So this is the human brain. Uh, it's uh, got uh, several broad structural uh, separations. The spinal cord is divided into individual components, uh, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. The cerebellum helps control movement. We'll delve into that later. There are some relay stations in here that help with the communication of sensory information and also the output of motor control in the middle. And then the cerebral hemispheres uh, are at the surface and are where some of the most high-level uh, uh, function is thought to reside. What is this all for? Well, you know, we think it's there to help orchestrate behavior uh, by adapting and storing information and guiding movement to be appropriate uh, for an environment. Um, and the units of computation, we don't know, but we think they're neurons. They might not, that might not be the relevant level of granularity. It might be synapses or it might be groups of neurons, and, and this is the the essence of the mysteries that we face. We don't know the primitives, the core units of computation in the brain, but there are ideas, and we'll, we'll, we, those, these are things that can actually be explored quantitatively. But whatever it is doing, it's pretty amazing. The outcome, perception, consciousness, control, uh, and uh, the central nervous system we'll talk about today, and then we'll get into the peripheral nervous system and, and then the output into musculoskeletal uh, later. So I always like to keep sort of the this very biggest picture in mind. Maybe it's because I'm a psychiatrist, but even when we're talking about neurons and, and synapses, consciousness is something that, uh, you know, it's kind of funny that there's a philosopher named David Chalmers who's divided this question of consciousness into the easy and the hard problems. And it's a little bit tongue in cheek because the easy problems are some of the hardest problems that we face in, in biology, but there's even a really much harder thing uh, uh, beyond that. When you think about consciousness, the very highest level version of what uh, human brain does, uh, and you think about what people sometimes refer to as consciousness, it's the ability to process information, um, ability to, to report on or comment on your mental states, access your own mental states, attention to them, to control behavior, to be awake or not. People have used the word consciousness to apply to all of these, but there's even a sort of a philosophically deeper question for consciousness, which is the subjective sense. When we see something red, you know, we, there's information processing, we register it as red, 
but there's there's more than that. There's a subjective sense. There's a quality of redness. Uh, there's a there's a, something that it means to be red to us, and that's something that presumably a computer doesn't uh, have. What that means is actually an active area of de debate and research by serious neuroscientists, and um, that's something if you're interested in, uh, I can help uh, uh, guide you to some resources. We'll get there uh, actually a little uh, a little bit later in the course. But back to this, this is uh, the, the information flow. There's, it's bidirectional from the spinal cord up and from the brain out. And the discrimination between white matter and gray matter you might have heard about. If you just take a piece of brain and you slice it and you look at it, there's parts that look white and there's parts that look uh, brownish uh, gray. The white part is very fatty. It's very got a very high lipid content. That's why it looks like uh, congealed fat. And the reason it's fatty is the axons, the long range uh, projections, are sheathed in a fatty tissue, which acts as a uh, effectively like an uh, insulator that influences the capacitance of the membrane. And it's, uh, improves the fidelity of long-range transmission uh, for reasons that we'll talk about. And this is more or less exactly what it looks like. If you take a slice through the brain, in the human brain there's about a two millimeter thick rim of uh, neurons that's at the surface. And all of this whitish stuff is this uh, lipid sheathed uh, uh, long-range wiring. The actual cell bodies are just limited to this thick region on the surface. There are some subcortical, what are called subcortical regions, clusters of deep uh, gray matter. But you can see the volume is vastly uh, dominated by the actual uh, wiring rather than the, the cells that give rise to the. Obviously, this is going to set major constraints on interventions. If you think about, are we going to stick an electrode in here to stimulate or record, you know, um, physical constraints that this stats and the targets that it provides are, are going to be very important. And so that's why knowing the anatomy uh, is important for engineers. Now information flows in, information goes out. Afferents is information coming in. Uh, there are major classes of information. There's somatic, classically think about as, as sensory. Proprioceptive. That's if you close your eyes, you still know where your joints and limbs are in space, and that's because there are little stretch receptors that, that report back to your brain on the angle uh, of your joints, and so that's awareness of yourself even without other kinds of sensory. sensory. Then uh, there's visceral. This is corresponding to nonspecific abdominal, for example, uh, type sensations you can get. It's not localizable to a particular uh, spot. But there are all kinds of stretch receptors in your intestines, on blood vessels, and they can report uh, very general feelings, even general malaise feelings, but they're coming from direct uh, uh, sensory signals coming from uh, blood vessels and internal organs. And then there are the specialized uh, senses, sight, hearing, uh, smell, and balance. And those flow in, uh, in most cases, uh, into the spinal cord. Uh, the origins of those fibers arise, for example, from the skin, and there are multiple synaptic relays along the way. Information comes out. This is the efferent. Remember that E for exit. Uh, this is uh, very uh, significant in terms of thinking about therapies as well. If someone uh, is suffering from a stroke or has, has had damage to the brain, many of their Control capabilities are limited because there's been damage to the efferent pathways. And so they can sense, they can think, they can plan actions, but they just can't execute them. And uh, there are neurons that are <coughs> involved in controlling the efferent flow of activity that uh, line what's called the uh, motor cortex, parts of the brain that control motor function and resolution and precision of the muscles that control. Uh, those uh, parts of the body are represented according to their complexity in terms of the real estate that they're allowed on the brain. Pretty interesting. If you have an amputation, if you lose function, you actually can have the, the, the representation, both for motor and sensation, is still there in the brain, at least for, for cause problems. In sensory uh, problems, you can have what's called phantom limb pain. Even if the limb is gone, you can still feel pain from the limb of abnormal action in the fibers and the neurons that formerly represented that limb. 
There are interesting correlates of that in other parts of the brain. People are of chronic blindness. There's a syndrome called uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome where very complex hallucinations are seen. Uh, this is not schizophrenia. It's not uh, psychosis. Uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of the equivalent of phantom limb pain except in the part of the brain that controls vision. So chronic deprivation uh, can lead to unregulated and spontaneous activity in the part of the brain that, that was involved in carrying out that uh, process. All we know is that sort of phenomenon. We don't understand the physiology behind that. So it's actually very hard to treat. People try giving general dampers of neural activity, kind of like anti-epileptic drugs, things that quiet everything down, shut down ion channels for this sort of thing. They're very nonspecific. They have huge side effects that cause sedation, sleepiness, cognitive problems. And that highlights some of the, the issues that we have in, in neuroscience. The outputs come all the way down through the spinal cord that control uh, uh, action. And if you cut a slice through the spinal cord, there's uh, you know, two basic sides to it. There's the sensory part, the dorsal part, and then there's the motor part or the ventral. So the motor neurons have their cell bodies in what's called a ventral horn, and they come out and act on muscles, sensory muscles, what are called dorsal root ganglion cells. These can actually, this is a reflex arc. It operates without even action on the uh, brain. You can have autonomous processing and reaction. It happens entirely within the spinal cord. As you go to higher levels, uh, you get more complex processing. And so the spinal cord, as you go up, ends about here. And then you have uh, structures called the medulla and the pons. And these regulate very primitive, very important functions, uh, respiration, digestion, heart rate, sleep, uh, uh, vasomotor control. That means blood pressure and uh, blood flexes. And then as you get to the pons, that gets to slightly higher level things, posture and balance. These are, you can't live without these. If, if they're creating tumors that arise in the pons, they cannot be surgically removed because uh, any attempt to carry out surgery in the pons will uh, be uh, essentially shut down fundamental uh, processes that are required. Typically limits you to chemotherapy and radiation. If the tumor is not responsive to those, there's uh, really no successful treatment. Uh, continuing progression up toward more advanced uh, parts of the brain, we get to the cerebellum, which is a fascinating structure. It actually, even though it's small, it has 90% of all the neurons in the brain live in the cerebellum because it's got a lot of extremely tiny neurons called granule cells. And it controls movement classically. That's what it's thought to involve. Um, but it also may have um, uh, some cognitive role as well. It's thought it might play a role in sequencing. Uh, thought, just as it plays a role in sequencing of motor actions. If you get very good at a motor action, playing the violin, uh, kicking a field goal, the motor patterns are thought to be stored there in the cerebellum, the sequencing of actions. A lot of uh, learning and plasticity that happens there. And there's basic movement, voluntary behavior, and then there's more advanced parts of the cerebellum that are called the cerebrocerebellum are thought to be involved in these. Uh, sequencing of, of actions and thoughts and, uh, that are at a higher level. In addition to having a vast number of neurons, some of the most complex neurons are in the brain. This, the Purkinje cells um, uh, have uh, about 100,000 synapses per cell. By the way, the number of different, which histologist you talk to, the number here is 70 to 90 percent of all CNS neurons that are cerebral granule cells. All, uh, uh, histologists agree Purkinje cells, which are a beautiful uh, cell that has a very enormous dendritic uh, tree, uh, has a probably tenfold greater synapses than your average synapse and uh, your average cell in the brain. Most cells in the brain have about 10,000. These have about 100,000 per cell. Those are the incoming uh, connections that, that are uh, uh, present on the cells, dendrites, which are its input. Uh, next level up, uh, get to the midbrain and the diencephalon, and here uh, we start to get into some pretty interesting disease-relevant uh, uh, structures. Um, the midbrain, so-called mesencephalon, has uh, the source of many uh, neurotransmitters that are involved in diseases like Parkinson's disease and depression. Uh, the substantia nigra is a 
particular part of the brain that histologically shows up as, as very dark, and that's because it makes uh, dopamine, which uh, is an important neurotransmitter, and uh, the enzymes that are required for production of dopamine make the structure uh, end up looking dark on histology. But you can actually see those neurons are lost in Parkinson's, and then the structure uh, looks different. You can just look at the brain and see this person must have. Um, can't do that with psychiatry. They're not nearly as good as diagnostic criteria for things. Uh, getting up almost to the downtown region now, we're up into the diencephalon. Uh, this is where the thalamus lives. Um, this is where a lot of incoming sensory information has a way station. There's a synapse here. Uh, there are a lot of neurons here that then send information up to cortex, and there's a lot of uh, important processing that happens there. You have a lesion to the thalamus, like with a stroke or damage, you get very interesting neglect syndromes, where you have somebody who appears normal but will simply not be conscious of stimuli coming from the part of the world that that part of the thalamus uh, registers. And this shows up in fascinating ways. If you ask them to draw a clock, someone with uh, a lesion to one side of the thalamus will the thalamus will draw just half a clock. They'll uh, draw the numbers all bunched onto one side of the clock. And so this sort of very high level awareness of uh, space and of the world is sensitive to lesions in the thalamus. It's where a lot of that is integrated. There's a little structure under the thalamus called the hypothalamus, which is also pretty interesting. It's the site of most of our basic drives. It tells you what you want and how much of it you want. There are neurons there that control hunger, thirst, uh, respiration, sex, sleep, anger. What's interesting is they're all jumbled together. So it's not as if there's a, a sex region and a sleep region. They're, those different neurons are all mixed together side by side. And that is, makes it hard for treatment, right? You couldn't put an electrode and correct someone's sleep disorder because you drive all these different neurons uh, at the same time. So that also is an interesting thing for engineers to think about, is how are we going to, uh, if someone has narcolepsy or something like that, some very serious sleep disorder, and if that's all regulated, these jumbled up neurons in the hypothalamus, how on earth are we going to come in and selectively control them? Even if we target an electrode or a pulse of energy of some kind, it's not going to be so good. There's almost no you know, other structure where this problem is as acute. There are related problems in other structures. If you think about the heart, as we'll get to, at least we know the heart's a pump. We can see the different parts that are involved in pumping and sending blood from one part to another. And we know the electrical conduction pathways. And we can put an electrode and stimulate. In many ways, uh, the heart, though, is complex in its own right. And it's not at all simple. Uh, but it's a much, much more challenging problem in the brain. Then we get into pretty high level uh, cortical and subcortical structures. There's this fascinating uh, banana shaped structure called the hippocampus, which where short term memories are stored. If you learn something in the moment, the memories that you formed a minute ago or a day ago are stored in the hippocampus. And over the course of a month or two or six months, those memories get offloaded to cortex for very long-term storage, and they get erased from the hippocampus. So it's like a short-term memory uh, buffer of sorts. Uh, it's an interesting structure for other reasons, too. Uh, people who have depression and people who are susceptible to post-traumatic stress disorder seem to have smaller hippocampi. This is just based on structural imaging. It's not known if this is causal or if it's a vulnerability factor. These are open questions. One of the very few anatomical findings that we have in psychiatry is that's pretty consistent. The hippocampus is a little smaller in, in depression, also in schizophrenia. Yeah. Is it any easier? It is. We, we can't image it as well as we'd like. There's a lot of substructure within it that we can't resolve. Uh, but you can actually see the hippocampus pretty well on a standard MRI, um, and you can quantify its. Um, the limits of MRI and CT scanning are something we'll get to in a little bit. But, and even that's just structural. Of course, we don't have act as much activity information as we would like. We can get that by other means as well. Then there's this uh, little spherical structure at the end, the amygdala, that's involved in uh, 
sort of adding valence, positive or negative color to your experiences. Uh, it's most classically associated with negative, rage, fear, anxiety, uh, but it also does play a role in positive, uh, rewarding, or addictive experiences as well. So it sort of adds a, a sort of value to experience. Both of these, both both of these structures communicate heavily with the parts of your brain that plan action, which are the cortical uh, structures. This is one other interesting thing about the hippocampus. This is a drawing done by a, a Nobel Prize winning Spanish anatomist named Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who in the early 1900s, he sort of marched through the brain, he and his students drawing these beautiful diagrams using a very specific stain called a Golgi stain that highlighted sparse neurons, but highlighted them very well, and that's illustrated here. Uh, you know, he found these neurons, traced them out in great detail. The hippocampus, this is like a slice through the banana, so on your, you know, it's like a slice of, of a banana that you put on your cereal. And if you do that, you see this interesting structure, there's a, a fiber pathway coming in. There's one layer of neurons that's called the dentate gyrus. Information coming out, there's another layer called CA3, CA Hornu aminus, Ammon's horn. Some early anatomists thought this looked like a. That goes to another layer, CA1, and that goes out. And so it's like a three layered neural network, okay? Feed forward neural network. This is actually the kind of thing that got me into neuroscience initially. And there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on here. There's synaptic plasticity. This is where synaptic strengths change particularly well. That happens everywhere in the brain, but particularly robustly here. And in the dentate gyrus, that's where it's the only site in the human brain where new neurons are formed in adulthood. And there's a lot of interesting questions surrounding that. Why in this first layer of this neural network that's involved in short-term memory, why is that the only place where adult neurons are, are uh, that's a really interesting question we might come back to. And then finally, the, the pinnacle of evolution, cerebral cortex, this uh, occupies uh, most of our uh, cerebral volume. Uh, it's got basic lobular subdivisions. The occipital lobe in the back uh, is involved in vision. Temporal lobe, heavily involved in uh, auditory experience. The hippocampus is embedded within the temporal lobe uh, as well. The uh, parietal lobe is heavily involved in sensation strip of sensory cortex here where all the incoming sensory information comes out. Off in the mathematical reasoning. Uh, frontal lobes are involved in planning, communication, uh, long-term goal-directed uh, activity. All right, now let's get into the physiology. Um, and this is where some of the most interesting uh, modern neuroscience is happening. So let's talk numbers. So we have about 10 billion neurons in our cerebral cortex. What does this tell us about processing? Well, we want to know what its processing language is to understand that. It's not enough to just know how many neurons. So neurons communicate with these things. These are uh, called action potentials, uh, also known as uh, spikes. Um, and they have about a 100 millivolt amplitude. They last for about a millisecond or two. Uh, and they travel uh, very rapidly along the axon. Uh, and when they hit the nerve terminal, they trigger release of neurotransmitter. And they have chemical information on to the next cell. Now, uh, they can appear uh, to operate at very high rates. So you can have, uh, you know, you know, the time scale here, 50 milliseconds. They can come at about one per millisecond. Uh, and optimal case. And so you could have, you know, up to a thousand pulses per second. Depending on how you think about it, this could give you a, a indication of upper bounds on uh, processing speed. You could end up with numbers like uh, you know, 10,000 gigahertz in cortex. Um, but what's interesting is modern computers are already easily, you know, in this and, and so it's, and yet they can't do the kind of processing that the brain does. So it doesn't give us a deep enough understanding of the computational capabilities of the brain, but it's a nice uh, way to, to quantitatively uh, frame the problem and look at the uh, upper bounds of what the 
capabilities might be. Um, by the way, Spike Train also appears to be a Japanese punk band of some kind, so you can get confused if there's an alternative uh, article you're reading. So then let's think about uh, uh, energy, uh, and what's amazing about the brain is the low energy uh, requirement that it takes. So very powerful computers, that, you know, the one that beat Gary Kasparov in uh, chess uh, a number of years back vastly more energy than he used. It did end up beating him, but it was a little bit close. Um, and so let's think about uh, where the power savings might come in. Where is the power utilized in the, in the brain? Most of that happens here at the synapses. These are the connections between neurons. The spikes or action potential that we talked about, they come barreling down and they hit this presynaptic terminal. The fact that you're having a membrane voltage deflection there opens channels ion channels that are voltage dependent, calcium channels, calcium comes in, allows vesicles containing neurotransmitter to freeze with this presynaptic membrane, and those transmitters leak out into the cleft rapidly across this very narrow uh, 40 nanometer or so cleft. Hit uh, uh, receptors on the postsynaptic side and open them and flow, and that triggers electrical events in the postsynaptic cell. Very fast process, but all these movements of ions down their electrochemical gradients then have to be restored. And so you've got very active pumps that are restoring those gradients at the same time as they're being run down by the communication system. So that's where most of the energy is used. It's used uh, at, at synapses. So right away you can see there's some cost there, and that also tells us how important the synapses are. If, if you could just do away with the synapse and just have the the spike just barrel on to the next neuron, that would seem faster, a heck of a lot simpler, probably less energetically costly, and yet we use this chemical synapse. And so why, why is that done? Well, a major hypothesis is that it's done this way to allow information storage. This is something that's tunable. You can tune the weight or gain of, of a synapse by adjusting any of these parameters. You could stick more ion channels in the postsynaptic membrane, have more vesicles in the presynaptic membrane, or you could affect their likelihood of release. All these things are actually have been shown in one way or another to actually happen, especially in structures like the hippocampus. So you're giving up a lot, you're giving up a lot uh, in energy and speed and complexity, but you could store information there. So we're going to uh, upload papers for you to read that uh, look at processes like LTP and LTD, long-term potentiation and long-term depression, which are these gain changes that happen. In, in, in. Okay, so what kind of storage capability are we talking about here? Well, you know, again, you get to somewhat uh, uh, paltry numbers. Uh, you know, if you think that you could store a bit per synapse, you don't get more than about 10,000 uh, gigabytes even across the entire cortex, and again, Computers are, are not that far off. Maybe there's other sites of information storage that are less well accepted or understood. People talk about storing information biochemically in gene expression uh, networks or maybe in patterns of excitability of cells. But this is by far the dominant paradigm. It's very theoretically tractable, uh, and it's, we can see things like that actually uh, happening in uh, the brains of, of, of <laughs> Now, people have tried to actually think about how much information actually is stored in the human brain. And, and I don't believe this sort of thing, but just to give you, it's a, that there are people out there in psychology and in uh, telecommunications that are interested in thinking about this sort of thing. And so they've tried to estimate the total amount of stored information <clears throat> uh, averaged over 70 years and calculated that there might be an input rate over those 70 years from reading of about one bit per second, uh, picture recognition. Uh, basic information about the world, uh, word knowledge, and they end up with sort of a, a gigabit a range, multiple gigabit range, which again is not that much. Um, I, I, the methods are suspect, but it's an interesting thing. To... This is a, a more, uh, <clears throat> I think, important theoretical uh, framework that uh, you should know about as, as bioengineering. There's a very influential uh, paper uh, from a guy named John Hopfield, now at Princeton, who uh, came up with a computational model for how memory might be stored using 
synaptic strength or gain modification. And so the basic idea that he had was the following. Let's consider uh, neurons as being units that could be either active or inactive. I color in two neurons, they might be active. And that is a brain state. That is uh, when your brain is experiencing a memory and you're in a, uh, what might be a unitary state of consciousness about something like remembering your grandmother's kitchen and the smell of something like uh, cookies, okay? And that, nobody knows if that's what a brain state is, by the way, or, or that's what the recall of memory is, but that's reasonable. Let's think about that. So some neurons being active being inactive in a specific way. And so, and these neurons, they're of course connected with, uh, as many neurons. Okay. And let's call these neurons, so that there are different uh, states. So here's one state, this is state uh, B. Uh, uh, and there are uh, different neurons, neurons I and J. Let's call this one I. And there's a synaptic strength between these neurons, okay? And this <coughs> synaptic strength, <coughs> you could call T, I, J. So that's the gain of the synapse between one neuron. And okay. So there's two aspects to this model. There's the dynamics and there's the information storage. First question is, what are its dynamics? How do you think about it playing out over time, the neural activity playing out over time? Well. Let's, let's think about what happens if you only have a partial sensory stimulus. What if <clears throat> you're somewhere else, you're not in the kitchen, you're, it's 20 years later, and you smell a chocolate chip cookie somewhere. Now that's only part of the memory, but somehow that can, as we all know, that can call back the full memory, and it can bring you back to that full state. So maybe we have to design our model where a partial memory can recreate a full memory. How could you do that? You could do that if this neuron and this neuron were strongly connected with each other. If the fact that they co-occurred in an important way in the past, if that strengthened their synapse, and so that way when you only had one active, it would tend to recruit the other one and it would cause the memory to come back. Okay, so all we need for that to work then is we need a, a, a storage rule such that when two neurons are active at the same time, the synaptic strength gets more powerful. Okay, so that is the information storage prescription, which is shown here, straight from the paper. Um, and, and if you actually look at it, if both, if you assign a binary value, if both neurons are on, assign a value of one to both of them. Uh, and that gives us a value of one here and one here. And while you're experiencing this state for the first time, you're gonna increment your synaptic strength by one because both neurons are on together. Uh, if they're both off together, actually that's also going to be predictive It suggests it should be strengthened as well. You'll have a minus one times a minus one, uh, so that will give us a plus one and we're going to increment our strength. So it doesn't matter on together or off together, that ends up indicating these neurons should follow each other in the future. Okay. But if they're different, uh, then you end up not incrementing strength. Okay. Then uh, uh, you don't end up with a positive uh, increment in the so that's the storage prescription. And this very simple thing, this is sometimes called a Hebb rule. Uh, it is similar to something that a guy named Donald Hebb uh, put forth in the 1940s. But we see this in the LTP and LTD synaptic physiology. If you stimulate two neurons at the same time in the hippocampus and the cortex, synaptic strength between them will get stronger. And so that we know this sort of process is playing out in the brain. And that's what's driven so much of the interest is we know that these rules are, are present. We don't know that they're used in the way that we hypothesize, but we know that they're used. And once you set up your synaptic strengths that way, then that makes the dynamics uh, happen appropriately because then exactly this plays out. Uh, this is now the dynamics rule, and if you sum across all the incoming uh, activity states in a, in a brain, the different neurons that could be coming into a, to a particular neuron, and the neuron has to be above a threshold to fire, to be active, a threshold that you could call U. And if the synaptic strengths tend to be uh, uh, high enough, that neuron will fire. Uh, and that gives us exactly the sort of dynamics that we need 
what's called associative memory recall. So that is a very, it's a simple thing. Uh, it's maybe more complex than we'd like, but it's still simple relative uh, to the brain. But it does have some very interesting uh, predict cap predictive capability, and it corresponds to things that we see in biology. And this capital N here, that's the number of neurons in the network, and you can store stably uh, up to about 0.15 in memories in the network. And so that's kind of interesting. It's not uh, the number of synapses, it's the number of neurons, and maybe that indicates why the total information storage that the brain may have is less than we would think by looking at synapses, even though uh, the synapse is used as part of the information storage mechanism. So that is Hebbian plasticity. Uh, it could be impaired in disease states, it could be enhanced, uh, but it's a major uh, theoretical construct to understand uh, learning and memory happen. Now, um, there's no question that more neurons based in part on the Hopfield model, but also based on intuitive understanding, you should be able to store more information the uh, larger your brain gets, and you should be able to plan and carry out more complex tasks. And, you know, we can see genome size hasn't changed too much in, in evolution, but brain size is really accelerating not only across species, but within a hominid evolution, you can see how much brain size here in cubic accelerated uh, over just the last few million years, uh, really a, a tripling of, of, of brain size, while the rest of the uh, uh, anatomical characteristics have, have not nearly changed as much. Um, so presumably, that's uh, relevant, but again, we don't causally know which of these are uh, actually uh, operative in information. Let's get into disorders. Um, here we've got some very interesting um, disease states which touch on very pressing areas of research in bioengineering today. Talk about Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, MS, schizophrenia, and depression. Okay, Parkinson's. I mentioned it's at least initiated by the loss of the dopamine neurons. These are neurons that make a particular chemical neurotransmitter. It's a small chemical. It's one of these things that diffuses across the synaptic cleft. And it's made by a series of enzymes uh, and gets loaded into vesicles. Uh, it acts on receptors that play major roles in controlling movement, memory, reward, planning, nausea, milk uh, uh, letdown or, or prolactin secretion. And it gets pumped back into the cell with dopamine pumps. Things like cocaine and amphetamines, they prevent the reuptake of dopamine, so it hangs around longer in the cleft and you get more dopamine, and that's probably the addictive uh, aspect. But it's also very important in movement. Uh, this incredible diversity is, shows some of the problems we have in designing good therapies. You can't just give dopamine back everywhere in the brain because you're going to pretty serious side effects if you're adding back all these functions or revving them up, and in fact, that's what we often see. Um, and here's some of the anatomical pathways that subserve these different functions. If you're in, uh, you know, if you're in the substantia nigra where these neurons live, there are projections going uh, all over the brain doing different things. Uh, the nigrostriatal pathway plays a role in movement. This is why you get Parkinsonian, major symptoms of Parkinson's. You get Bradykinesia, which means slow movement. You move very slowly, you're very stiff. This is called rigidity, and you have a resting tremor. And that's all largely due to this uh, pathway. Then there's the mesolimbic pathway, number two. This goes to a structure called the nucleus accumbens. It's a subcortical structure that's involved in reward and pleasure. And so this is probably where the drug of abuse uh, patients who are treated for Parkinson's by revving up their dopamine can get into issues like increased seeking of reward, pathological gambling behaviors. Uh, that is a very interesting, probably spillover between the action of dopamine and those two different things. Mesocortical goes to the frontal lobes, the frontal cortex. That's involved in uh, attention, planning, and memory. And one thing we see in depression is patients become, in, in Parkinson's, is patients become depressed and also demented. They can't form long-term memories probably related to that projection. 
Then you've got this uh, tuberous infundibular pathway, as it's called, which actually which goes to the hypothalamus and helps. That in turn goes to the pituitary gland, which controls uh, uh, prolactin secretion and uh, milk letdown during nursing. Very different functions. In fact, if you uh, some antipsychotic medications that modulate dopamine can actually cause lactation even in men, which is a pretty. In fact, there's a lot of lawsuits going on about that. Um, so, uh, this treatment for the first 10 years or so of Parkinson's, you can treat it with this medication called L-DOPA or Levodopa, which is a form or precursor of dopamine that can be uh, absorbed from the GI tract and can cross the blood-brain barrier, which tends to, which is part of the vasculature of the brain that tends to prevent charged or polar chemicals from accessing the brain. But this works. It really helps them for about 10 years or so with the major symptoms. It doesn't really help with posture, gait, or dementia, or depression. Uh, and there are side effects, abnormal movements, the pathological gambling as well. Dystonias are twisting and repetitive movements, and dyskinesias are sort of jerky movements. And as you get overactivity of the pathways, you get the. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's uh, at its course, at its most fundamental level, it's, it's having an overly optimistic view of the outcome of what's going to happen. Have people who, if you ask them, they and you can actually do very well structured uh, laboratory tests of, of people who are experiencing this. They'll simply have a higher, more optimistic uh, assessment of the outcome of a, of, of a likely uh, risky endeavor. And so, in terms of pathological, what that means is they're hurting themselves socially or, or economically. And and so you see people with Parkinson's. You know, about five to ten percent of them will incur. You know, they'll they'll, they'll gamble when they didn't before, or if they were gamblers, they'll gamble now. Suffer uh, uh, socially or economically. So pathological just means it's causing a problem. Okay, that's Parkinson's. Alzheimer's, uh, pretty interesting, uh, and probably it's going to dominate our medical landscape, actually, in the coming uh, decades, uh, because the fraction of the society that's going to be sitting around with Alzheimer's is, is going to stop. Uh, but we don't know really what causes it, and we certainly don't have effective treatments. It's memory loss, it's personality and behavioral changes, impaired planning, goal-directed activity. You have loss of amyloid proteins, which you have accumulation of amyloid proteins, and you have loss of neurons. This is an extracellular protein that builds up in what are called plaques. You get tangles of proteins inside cells. You have reduced cells and synapses throughout the brain, including a kind of cell that releases a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. There are, there are very, very minimally effective treatments. There are drugs that inhibit breakdown of acetylcholine, like Aricept, but they have tiny, tiny effects on, on the cognitive problems. And so really, we, we really don't have a good treatment. Some modulators of glutamate receptors, a different neurotransmitter, help it. But again, very, very tiny effects, even questionable that there is an effect. The problem with that is it's all across the brain, so it's hard to think of a, of a focal intervention, a transplant, an electrode. It's, it's very diffuse, so hard to treat. Multiple sclerosis, this is an interesting one. This is a demyelinating disorder. So this is where you lose the myelin uh, sheath. And that, as we'll talk about in our next lecture, the peripheral nervous system lecture, that will reduce the fidelity and speed of propagation of action potentials along axis. And because of all, that's a very general thing. And so depending on where this, this tends to show up sort of focally in little patches. And so wherever that patch shows up, that's where you tend to see the problems. And so you can get very different things. You can get, you know, uniocular blindness. You can, you can get sudden loss of function of an extremity. Uh, you can have uh, funny sensations, uh, what are called paresthesias, tingling. You can have uh, weakness. And this tends to progress. It gets better. It gets worse. There are versions that are called relapsing, remitting, and then there are rapidly progressive. Uh, we think it's an autoimmune disorder, and there are treatments that dampen down immune responses that help a little bit. Um, very often, visual symptoms are the first ones, which for reasons we don't know. An example of what some of those patches look like. Uh, they show up on certain kinds of MRI scan, those little white patches in the brain. Lose this uh, sort of fatty sheath, which is there to reduce the capacitance of the axon. And so you have high capacitance, and that reduces the uh, propagate. 
schizophrenia, getting into psychiatry. We have very little solid anatomical findings in, in uh, psychiatry, uh, nothing that can help you on an individual patient level to make a diagnosis. But if you average across many patients, there's larger ventricles in schizophrenia, which are these fluid-filled cavities in the middle of the brain. What does that mean? Does it, is it just an epiphenomenon of some other developmental problem? Does it mean they have less wiring uh, space available and so they can't communicate from one part of the brain to another? We don't really know. They also tend to have smaller hippocampal so what's going on there? Well, you know, we know that if you give people too much dopamine, you can get psychosis too. What is psychosis? That's altered perception of reality. And so that includes hallucinations, paranoia, uh, and drugs that block dopamine receptors tend to be those that are therapeutic, in, in, uh, including the type 2 dopamine receptor, so haloperidol being one of them. Uh, and so this is, you know, but we don't have a deep circuit level understanding that dopamine is involved somehow. Uh, we think using functional brain studies that different parts of the brain maybe are not in sync. They don't show, are not normally coactive uh, as they would be uh, in a normal case together. And they're asynchronous. And so one thought is that there's just one part of the brain is not telling the other part of the brain what it's doing. And so an auditory hallucination might be the patient's own inner thoughts that aren't recognized as such. And in many cases, there's a sort of a running commentary to the auditory hallucinations, which is not too dissimilar from what your own internal thoughts uh, uh, may be. Depression, this is what one of my clinical uh, focal areas. It's very, very common, um, very chronic and recurrent. Uh, you know, even if you treat someone successfully, most of them will have a, a severe relapse within five years. Um, very, very much of a problem. Both of these are very biological. So, you know, they have very different symptoms you have this hopelessness, worthlessness, guilt, thoughts of death. Schizophrenia, it's more delusions, hallucinations, disorganized behavior. Very costly. Different epidemiology, sort of one versus ten percent moment. But both very highly genetic and they share some features, reduced hippocampal volume. The point of this is to show you very biological, physical, very costly and common. And yet this is this is the level of our understanding. We don't know at the tissue level, at the circuit level, what's going on. We just know that there are these very debilitating, diverse uh, symptoms. and um, Major, major opportunity for quantitatively minded uh, engineers to make headway. Okay, so let's talk uh, about instrumentation in the brain. We'll go through this relatively quickly because a lot is not known. There's a lot of basic opportunity, but, but uh, and then we'll get to our case study at the end. This is just a useful resource for you. It gives you an indication of the temporal and spatial scales over which different categories of diagnosis and intervention reside. But you can see there's nothing really spanning everything. So usually, there's usually a trade-off. If you want high speed, you tend to be more focused, focused on one uh, very substructure. If you want, want to look globally, you tend to sacrifice immensely in spatial and temporal. And I'll give you some examples of that. We have what's called magnetoencephalography. This is a way of picking up signals in the brain that are generated magnetically and turning them in, into uh, currents that you can detect. Um, and so this is a bit like EEG, electroencephalography, a little bit spa better spatial resolution, uh, about five-fold. You can get about two millimeter resolution. That's very fast. It basically uses Maxwell's equations to, to, to calculate uh, that there was uh, some synchronized activity that uh, was occurring in a particular spot in the brain. EG is much simpler, a uh, little bit less resolution, but uh, you can just use basically a shower cap with a lot of uh, wires on it. And But again, it, because both of these are extracellular, they can only pick up synchronous activity, uh, millions and millions of neurons that are firing together. And then you can barely pick up a signal at the surface. But you can, you got sort of centimeter resolution uh, and very high temporal resolution. And that, you can see these different oscillations that happen. These are brain waves, different frequencies, so-called uh, alpha, beta, theta, delta. Delta shows up in, in deep sleep, alpha during uh, uh, arousal and attention. See if your eyes are closed and then occipital cortex when your eyes open, you see this much uh, lower amplitude, higher frequency uh, alpha rhythm. Close your eyes in the occipital lobe. You get back to a sort of a slower, uh, higher amplitude uh, delta wave. 
And you can see abnormal activity, these tend to slow in dementia, uh, non-specifically across all frequencies. These seizures, you can start to see if you're recording uh, uh, heavily synchronized activity at the onset of a seizure, and so that can be used uh, for diagnosis. Functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, picks up changes in oxygen consumption, the ratio of oxyhemoglobin to deoxyhemoglobin. Uh, it can be picked up as a ma magnetic susceptibility difference on a particular kind of MRI. Won't delve into the details of it here, but this gives you a flavor of the sort of resolution you can get. These blobs indicate uh, sort of centimeter scale uh, changes in oxygen utilization which means the neurons are more active in that particular. PET scanning is relating to glucose metabolism, uh, and that uses a positron emission from uh, modified uh, glucose as a PET label, for example. Uh, so you can have um, a modified glucose uh, that's uh, uptaken more in highly active brain regions, and so you can pick up the concentration of the glucose, and you can get, again, the sort of low spatial resolution, but it lets you see if someone's thinking, you can see a PET signal in frontal cortex. If they're hearing something, you can see a PET signal in auditory cortex. Uh, visual uh, uh, stimulation, you can tend to see something in the occipital uh, cortex, and so it gives you that sort of low level resolution. Something we worked on is uh, a structural study uh, that lets you see the brain uh, structure. We've done this in mouse and human brains. This is a mouse brain over some text, actually, text written by Ramon y Cajal, the Spanish anatomist, before and after the clarity procedure. You can read text right through it, but they're actually sitting right there. And we do that by uh, removing all the lipids. And the lipids are what cause light scattering. They make the brain opaque because they scatter photons that would otherwise pass through tissue. Do that by first building in a very dense, uh, uh, covalently linked hydrogel structure within the brain, and that let, lets us very vigorously use detergents and electrophoresis to, to force all the lipids out, and so the brain becomes. And so that, that's pretty cool. You can, this is a whole mouse brain where you can see projections going all the way through it. Um, this is a movie play of a brain labeled here. Each of these are Cortex, this is hippocampus. Little blobs are uh, going to the scale bars, each of those little structures. And you can kind of look through, it's like a fantastic voyage type thing. You can fly around. The particular label here is yellow fluorescent protein that's present in long range projection neurons. And so if you follow along the track, Cortex, the surface of the brain, campus. So we're using that for a variety of things, looking at human samples, looking for abnormalities in axon, uh, three-dimensional structure in autism, for example. That's a high-resolution structure, and there's a lot of other things you could do with it, we're working on ways of actually making the gel conducting, too, so we could have some active interrogation. So this is our, this is hopefully one of the more fun and interesting parts of the class. Um, what I'm going to do is kind of present to you a case. And the goal here is to um, just get a flavor of the complexity and confusion and the panic that can happen in a really bad and confusing clinical situation and, and see the kinds of challenges that uh, engineers might be able to help with by bringing a little order to the, to the chaos. And so on day one, I'll, I'll give you the sort of chief complaint, initial presentation of the patient, and, and, and what you guys will, you'll, you'll, you know, these are, these are interesting cases, complex cases, which the physicians involved couldn't figure out. So you're not going to figure them out, okay? The, the goal is just help you think about it, think about possibilities, make what we call a differential diagnosis. What, what, what are the main categories of things you think might be going on? And then think about the kind of tests that either exist or that you'd like to build that would help bring uh, a light to the to the question. Okay, so no no pressure. It's more an exercise in, in thinking how, how you can get uh, uh, toward the, the right end. Okay, so chief complaint: a 26 year old woman she comes in. She's admitted for headache, inability to communicate, behavioral changes, and abnormal movements. 
pretty complicated right away. That's not a typical presentation on the neurology or psychiatry service, where you get these very vague, non-quantitative, but very debilitating comments. History of the present illness. How did this happen? Seven weeks ago, diffuse headache, especially in the occipital area, neck stiffness, down sensitivity, blurred vision, nausea, vomiting. She had a history of migraine. She took her migraine meds. It didn't help. Six weeks ago, getting more complex, dysphoria, that's like depression, it's feeling bad, uh, sleepiness, short-term memory problems, confusion, agitation, and depersonalization. This is feeling like you're not really real, something that happens in schizophrenia all the time. There's no lab test for it, the patient just reports that. Okay, what does it mean? Five weeks ago, getting worse. Much worse. Worsening confusion, uh, transfer to the psychiatry service. Okay, that's where we sit now. What's her history? Well, history of migraine, obesity, some allergies, some drug use. Okay, maybe that's relevant. Cigarette smoker, history of cocaine, amphetamine, ecstasy, and salvia, divinorum. Uh, some travel history. Okay. Yeah, she had a good, that was a good party. I, I want to invite. Um, some exposures to things, insecticides. Okay, this could be relevant. Okay, family history. Okay, some autoimmune stuff, multiple sclerosis, and rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, uh, hepatitis, that's interesting. History of aneurysm, history of epilepsy in the family. All right, no pressure. What do you think <laughs> is the basic category? These are big categories. What do you think is the primary cause of this patient? Do you think it's drugs? Do you think it's stroke? Do you think it's schizophrenia? Do you think it's infection? Do you think it's epilepsy? Do you think it's cancer? Do you think it's multiple sclerosis? And remember that I'll tell you the docs involved got this completely wrong, so not one of drugs. <laughs> What we got? Yeah, let's try. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody thinks it. People think MS. Okay. All right. So let's. All right. So I'm going to do one more bit. Uh, we'll wrap up in about four minutes. But we got a little more information before you get to the next step. Do it in an exam, physical and mental status exam. Okay, so talking to her, and this was rapidly changing, so it progressed over three days. Her speech became garbled and incoherent. She started to hyperextend her arms. What's that about? Unresponsive to verbal stimuli. <clears throat> Pupils became sluggish, sluggish reactive, but equal. They were the same size, okay? So there's not an asymmetrical thing going on. All kinds of medications tried, nothing helped, okay? Pain medications, anti-inflammatories, opiates. This is a migraine med, nothing worked. Psychiatry meds. E2 blockers, anti-anxiety, anti-epileptics, nothing helped. Hospital course, worse and worse, oromotor mouth dyskinesias, uh, continuous movements of head and neck, stop speaking, mouth nonsense when prompted, fever, tonic-clonic seizure, that's a generalized seizure involving the whole body, heart rate slowed down to 30 to 39 beats per minute, intubated, never liked to see this, became unresponsive to all stimuli. Pinpoint but equal pupils, no focal or lateralizing signs. Okay, let's revote. Same question. 
nobody thinks it's now drugs. Okay, that's the main change. Um, a lot of people still liking multiple sclerosis, and a lot of people thinking about infection now. That's interesting. Adjusting, noting anti-epilepsy drugs didn't work. Cancer now lower. This is pretty rapidly progressive, so you're kind of make calls there. Um, Okay, and so now, last thing before you go, uh, the concept of the differential diagnosis. If you've seen uh, house or ER, this is the kind of thing people talk about for delirium or central nervous system dysfunction. It can be so complex that it can, helps to have a mnemonic. And a lot of docs actually use these to make sure they don't forget a major category of thing that could be going on. I watch death is used a lot in the ICU for delirium or central nervous system dysfunction. I stands for infection, all those causes. Withdrawal, all the drug withdrawals. A for acute metabolic changes, acid base shifts, uh, failure in some of the organs that help you clear and detoxify your blood. Trauma, okay, there could be something uh, subtle going on that was due to an injury that we don't know about. Other intra, intra central nervous system pathology. A lot of other things start from outside and affect the brain, but what about things starting in the CNS? abscesses, bleeds or hemorrhages, uh, infection, seizure, stroke, tumor, inflammation or vasculitis, inflammation of the vessels, encephalitis, inflammation of the brain overall, meningitis, inflammation of the meninges, which are the lining of the brain, syphilis, a long-acting uh, infectious process, hypoxia, impaired oxygen, all those causes. Deficiencies, you get crazy stuff from vitamin deficiencies in the brain. Endocrine changes, thyroid, glucose, all kinds of, of, of things relating to that. Acute vascular things, uh, stroke and shock, not enough or too much blood pressure. Toxins, drugs, pesticides, solvents. Heavy metals kind of falling in that category but helping you make the acronym work out. Okay, but you can't just test for everything. You have to kind of have some logic. You have to sequence things. Everything costs something. Everything takes time. And so you have to go with your best guess, what's most likely, and what test could we do that would help maximally in, in separating out the space of possibility. So that's kind of one of the most exciting and interesting aspects. You don't have the right tools for the brain, the crude tools, but you have to differentiate somehow.